Welcome to Shook Cover Lit, where we wrangle the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we are here for the first of a seven-part series as we journey through The Hunger Games. We are breaking this down so that each part of the book is actually two vi videos. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened in the first five chapters of this? So, chapters one through five. Very simple. Katniss, who is a girl from a dystopian American future, District 12 specifically, volunteers as tribute when her youngest sister, and only sister, is selected during the reaping. Uh, which is basically, every year they select two children from every district to compete in a battle royale made for television bloodbath for the entertainment of the rich. Katniss, along with Pita, who is the male contestant, travel to the capital and are guided to, uh, by their district's sole surviving champion, Haymitch. Uh, and we are left as they're parading around the capital in a, basically a, a, the gladiatorial parade. That's it. It's what's happening. We have the Hunger Games. But there is a lot of things happening within this. Okay. First off, I would like to start by praising how close to good writing this really is. How close to good writing this really is. Listen to this paragraph from page five. As soon as I'm in the trees, I retrieve a bow and sheath of arrows from a hollow log. Electrified or not, the fence has been successful at keeping out the flesh eaters from the District 12. Inside, they roam freely, as well as venomous snakes, rabbit animals, and paths to follow. But there's food if you know how to find it. My father taught me. I was 11. Five years later, I wake up screaming. That's a pretty good paragraph, right? Okay. That's a pretty good, is that not a pretty good, it sets up mystery for the future. It sets up, it gives us an idea of the district that they're living in. And it tells us very briefly how she's living her life and why. But it does not go too far into depth, right? Excuse me, I'm just, I'm taken aback slightly. You've got the vapors. I, Lord, I got the vapors because, uh, wow. I, unfortunately, Okay, there we that go. That is not how the paragraph exists in the book. <laughs> this is the paragraph as it exists in the book. Remember how terse that paragraph was. Okay. How straight, direct, to the point, and without superfluity that paragraph was. Instead, um, this, is the, this is the paragraph we get. As soon as I'm in the trees, I retrieve a bow and sheath of arrows from a hollow log. Electrified or not, the fence has been successful at keeping the flesh eaters out of the District 12. Inside the woods, they roam freely, and there are added concerns like venomous snakes, <coughs> pardon me, uh, venomous snakes, rabbit animals, and no real paths to follow. But there's also food if you know how to find it. My father knew, and he taught me. Some of, uh, some before he was blown to bits in a mine explosion. There was nothing even to bury. I was 11 then. Five years later, I still wake up screaming for him to run. There's just too many details there for it to be really okay. good writing. We remove all of the mystery of her father's death right there, instead of letting that build. So I just, seven part series. Yes. We are four minutes in. Yes. I just want to establish that Adrian Ford, you are praising Suzanne Collins, writer of the young adult series, The Hunger Games, for having some quality. There's good stuff here. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that was established and on camera, just in case I ever need it for the future. Okay, uh, I have read this before. I uh, read this when I was working at the Hastings. I actually read it while I was working at the Hastings. Literally, I'd just grab it and read it. Um, I enjoy this book. I would agree with you in the sense that I, I enjoyed this book to the ending. I do not like the ending. I think it cops out very uh, Hollywood young adult style. But up until that point, I was sold on it. And I think this could have been a quality book had they ended it correctly. So we'll definitely come back to that. Okay. But I, uh, I need to make it clear that there are movies for this. Correct. I have not seen the movies either. Okay. I have. Okay. Um, I have read this one. I have read the second book. I stopped at that point because it's garbage henceforth. Um, I know I've seen the first movie, and I think that's the only movie I've seen, to be honest. But anyway, okay, this is uh, refreshing and different. Um, 
Do you want to start with this, or would you like me to start? Well, I've already started. But... Okay, well, quality where quality is due. We have uh, some flavors of Shirley Jackson in here. Absolutely so, 100%. Okay. Um, with the idea of the reaping, reaping the idea of the lottery, uh, you know, drawing for basically slaughter and the entertainment, and basically because this is just the way it is. Um, this was established by the Capitol to basically remind people of, you know, the bad times. Uh, but at this point, it is tradition. It's the way it is. So I would argue some heavy influence from Shirley Jackson's The Lottery. Um, and and that's, there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. I, I think it's a good idea. Now, if I understand correctly, this got some criticism because it is basically... It was either already a book or already a movie. I think it was Japanese in origin called like Battle Royale, where it was literally the exact same premise. Oh, wow. And like a lot of schluff towards Suzanne Collins because like it's basically just stolen literature. But all good literature is stolen. The Lion King is Hamlet with paws. So I, I'm excited to hear your opinions on this. I, I think this is going to be an interesting journey. But yeah, let's go ahead and dive into it. Let's uh, let's work on this. I'm so not sure what to do. I'm glad you brought up your Shirley Jackson okay. theory. Because there are other little things as well in these first five chapters. What is our protagonist's name? Katniss. What is... What does it sound... What? So what's the core word there? Cat. Cat. Mary Cat. Mary Cat. She spends several passages telling us about poisonous plants. She does. She's very ritualistic as well. Very ritualistic. There is a drunk slash deranged uncle type. Is there not in the in Hamish Hamish. character? We also have the question of ghosts. In um, House on Haunted Hill, we didn't know if ghosts were real or not, did we? We did not. If ghosts are not real, what literally is a ghost? I, something internal within you that's it's haunting a, you. Sort of like a memory. Okay. The way that this character's life is changed by the ghost of her father. Interesting. Uh, if I may add to that a little bit more, uh, we also have the dynamic of the older sister, Mary Cat, uh, caring for the younger. Right. In, a, in a bit of a flipped fashion, if we're looking at Mary Cat and Constance. A right. flipped fashion, but yes, but with that same premise where the uh, oldest sister is caring for the younger because the head of household is incapable at this point. So hot damn, there's a lot more Shirley Jackson in here. Isn't it commented on how pale Prim is? Mm-hmm. Wasn't Constance very pale in, yep. the, in the books? Very quiet, very reserved, nurturing. Yeah. Okay, so a lot of shades of Shirley Jackson early on in the Hunger Games. That's that's a good correlation. That's a good point. We're good at this. So I there's a small phrase in here that triggered me off into a bigger journey. Okay. On page eight, um, the last full paragraph ends with this. I try to forgive her for my father's sake, but to be honest, I'm not the forgiving type. How ironically are we allowed to read this? In an adult text, I take a phrase like that and I say, okay, this is an insecure character. This is from a speaker that is posturing and feels compelled to tell us how strong she is because she is very weak. However, this is a young adult text. Okay. And I think we're... I think we are compelled in a young adult text to offer more credulity to our speaker than that. Okay. Uh, I think that is one of the defining hallmarks of young adult literature versus literature, quote unquote literature. I think that if this, if I were picking this up, this would immediately have a different reading if I did not have to go to the young adult section of Barnes & Noble to get this. Okay. Is that fair? It is fair. Um, talking a little bit about writing as well, I, I think Suzanne Collins, I, I agree with you. This, this would be, I would enjoy this much more if this was not sold towards young adults. However, from a marketing standpoint, Suzanne Collins knows what she's doing. Well, and also from a writing standpoint, yeah. like this is not good writing for adult literature. 
but this is good writing for young adult literature because very subtly buried into this because you opened to page eight and I had it bookmarked here, um, we have some writing in here that seems innocent enough, seems playful and coy, but is just sexually charged. And for a young adult series, you know, someone who is uh, coming into their sexuality for the first time, they've gone through puberty, they're growing into an adult, these little hints here, they're just those flags that spark interest. Um, talking about pulling blackberries from a bush, and may the odds he tosses a berry in a high arc towards me. I catch it in my mouth, break the delicate skin with my teeth, the sweet and tartness explodes across my tongue be ever in your favor. Skip down a little bit, we immediately move to, I watch Gale as he pulls his knife out and slices the bread. He could be my brother. So out of nowhere talking about food, we move directly into, you know, this could be my brother. Obviously there's a sexual attraction here. Sexual charge text for a young adult reader, 15, 16 years old, who this would have been sold to. There's your fucking, there's your ploy. There's your catch. So I think Along those lines, um, you fool, that there is another noticeable distinction in genre to be pointed out. Okay. In adult text, that is taken as sexual charge. In young adult text, this is all about the games. Okay. If this, so there's that, there's the travel between where we are in that passage. Point A, point B. And we're, we're getting there on a train. Mm -hmm. Train goes through the mountain, mm -hmm. which again is Freudian imagery. But if this were a new adult text, that charge of nervousness is when Katniss and Peeta would lose their virginity to one another. Okay. That is a new adult twist on this tale. Okay. So there's all sorts of little ways that I think that the, so. You took an uncomfortable amount of notes on this. I've got a lot of stuff. I've got a lot of stuff here. Um, I think that one of the most important things about young adult literature is that it is improves as and serves as a training grounds to read literature as literature. And We've got this from 12, and this is another way that I will point to good writing almost. If this had a, if this had a cutthroat editor, this would have been a very good adult text. Pretty dress, says Gail. Madge shoots him a look, trying to see if it's a genuine compliment or if he's just being ironic. It is a pretty dress, but she would never be wearing it ordinarily. She presses her lips together and then smiles. Well, if I end up going to the Capitol, I want to look nice, don't I? Now it's Gail's turn to be confused. You don't, does she mean it? Or is she messing with him? I'm guessing the second. You won't be going to the Capitol, says Gail coolly. If this were a Hemingway text, which is quintessential adult literature, right? Okay. So much subtext, right? This is, this is, there is no subtext in this at all. No. This is. is all in the literature. This is all in the writing. So if this were a Hemingway text, it would read as such. Pretty dress, he says. You won't, uh, pretty dress, he says. Well, if I end up going to the Capitol, I want to look good, don't I? You won't be going to the Capitol, right? Instead, we've got paragraphs of things in there. The good writing's there, but it's just buried in the layers. Is, yeah, it's buried in the layers. Part of me wonders, um, as this is a young adult text, this is 374 pages. This is sort of, if you go to the young adult section in the Barnes & Noble, this is sort of on the small side for one of those texts, it isn't is. it? It is. So part of me has to wonder if um, Suzanne Collins had submitted this text and they said hey i'm sorry this is young adult and she said okay well publish it as young adult well it's not big enough oh well let's spice just go back and spice it up, spice yeah. it up. Uh, that's how some of these things feel um as we uh, continue to talk a little bit i sorry you got me excited about this a little bit um the difference between adult literature and young adult literature uh when we look at characters as well the idea of haymitch 
Hey, Mitch. In well, the... if I could, if I could finish that previous point Please real do. quick, Please because do. you're transitioning into uh, the characters. Um, the reason that I say YA serves as a training ground for adult text, for a, however you want to say it, for literature, um, is in fact that in Hemingway, for example, this is all subtext. So that when you get to Hemingway. In all of this paragraph, Matt shoots him a look trying to see if he's a genuine compliment or if he's just being ironic. With all of that missing, the adult reader, who is independent from the text instead of reliant upon it, looks at those things and says, okay, there's more going on there. What am I putting into the text? Okay. What can I grab from the text? So that it, just in the language part of things, that's how YA serves as a training ground for uh, more advanced texts. Okay. And there are some YA themes throughout this. The idea of the dystopian future seems to be very heavy YA, although it not always was. I mean, we look at uh, Anthony Burgess, Clockwork Orange, definitely not a YA text, uh, but for some reason this became a big uh, setting for YA literature. Uh, Character-wise, though, as I'm bringing this up, hey Mitch, from the YA standpoint of things, he's a drunk. He's the fool, the buffoon, the drunk. But when we look at this through a different light, from a, a seasoned reader's perspective, an adult reader's perspective, no, Haymitch is a victim. Haymitch is hurting. Because Haymitch killed 23 children. And now people love him for it. And that's all he will ever be known as. Yeah, so that's something I want to touch on. And so the reason that that is as it is in this text with Haymitch being the buffoon is because in a young adult text we're offering Katniss as the speaker all of this credulity that we talked about earlier, correct? Okay. Now, it is important to recognize right off the bat she hates Haymitch um, because he's a disgusting loon when in fact, he is a tragic survivor. Who's the one other person in this text so far that draws her ire in that way? Draws her in that way as a tragic survivor? Draws her ire in that way. Who else does she hate in this text? I'm not sure who you're getting at. Katniss one. hates her mother. Oh, okay. Is, is her mother yes. a quitter or is she a tragic survivor? Tragic survivor. So... That sets us up for potential growth. I, so if she ends up accepting her mother and accepting Hamish and trying to be the hero that they could not, we get a hero. We get an adult text hero. If at the end of this novel, she still hates both of these characters, we've lost an opportunity for growth. It is important, I think, to look at that in light of this. On page 27, sweet, tiny Prim, who cried when I cried before she even knew the reason, who brushed and plaited my mother's hair before we left for school, who still polished my father's shaving mirror each night because he'd hated the layer of coal dust that settled on everything in the seam. The community home would crush her like a bug. So I kept our predicament a secret. Prim is the exact opposite. Prim is willing to offer that sympathy okay. immediately, regardless of the level of victimhood put on display. That, regardless of the, le the, the level of herodom put on display. That lack of sympathy, though, that, that we get from Katniss, though, it's the survivor's mentality. Because she is the adult in this situation. She has to be the adult to care for the mother. She has to be the adult to make sure Prim is going to survive. It's that cold survivalist mentality that does not give her any space for sympathy. If you are a weak character, she does not have time for you because weak do not survive. So I think, so you called it a survivor mentality. Okay. Survivor means, Hamish is a survivor. Hamish is a survivor. The mother character is a survivor. She is. So is Katniss. Yes. So there is no survivor mentality. There is a fighter mentality. Okay, we can All go of those fighter mentality. Yeah, yeah. That's so, maybe a so, better word for it. But we are left to believe with our, in our heart of hearts that Hamish had been a fighter. He had. And I'm telling you right now, you want, like we always talk about Harry Potter fan fiction, 
You give me the story of Haymitch on Reaping Day. That's a story. I'm five chapters into this and I would read that. That's a good one. Now, uh, a counterpoint to Katniss here, we have PETA. We haven't really spoke much about PETA just yet. Right. Uh, this is a different upbringing in the 12th district. Uh, this is a young man who physically has the tools for this fighting survival mentality. He's uh, a baker's son, so he's well fed. He's a little stocky, so he's got some you know weight to throw around. He's got some girth behind him. But he does not have the piss and vinegar mentality that Katniss does. He's a much softer character. He's much more he's sensitive. Um, he's caring. He's nurturing. So there's growth there as well. Because in this, in order for him to survive as far as he can into this situation, he has to change. He has to make that change. He has to kill. And it keeps being brought up throughout this story that Katniss, you know, starts to let her defense down a little bit as she becomes more and more comfortable on the train and realizes, I can't do this. I have to kill him. Right. That's good. That's good stuff. Yeah, that's, that's very good stuff. I'm surprised that you had taken to this text so negatively. Um, one thing that you touched on a little bit at the beginning of that was this is a dystopian novel. It is. This is a YA novel. Yep. One thing that strikes me about this, which is ever more branding of this as YA, is that the construct of school survives the apocalypse. Okay. Um, even in this poor district, we're still going to school. Okay. So I think that that is something which, um, in good writing, the reader needs a reason to identify with the protagonist. In great writing, a reader gets to identify with the antagonist. But here, we're identifying certainly with the protagonist. I don't know if PETA is going to become the antagonist. That would be a very <clears throat> compelling twist because we've already got so much built up for him. But the construct of school surviving the apocalypse is interesting. Okay. I, and it gives it would give young readers a reason to identify with yes. a, a quick reason to identify with these characters. So I want to backtrack a little bit. You said uh, reacting negatively to this. Um, I, I do enjoy this text. I do. I, I enjoyed my first reading this. I thought it was wonderful. Um, I will tell you right now. I'm not going to spoil this for you, but the ending of this, the last I don't know five chapters, we'll say. I'm not sure. No, somebody else wrote them. They're not good. Complete shift. You have what's building up to be a good novel. Everything's working right. Everything's firing correctly. You're enjoying the read. And because of the author's decisions, the editor's decisions, I don't know, but you put your name on it. So the author's decisions, the whole thing falls apart. You lose all worth in this book for naught. Really? And that is why I don't like this text. That's what's infuriating about this text. Had The Hunger Games been a standalone, on-the-shelf novel, that's it? Absolutely. You got a hot ticket item, I'm about it. We traded one good novel for three subpar novels in a movie. I am willing to bet that, though I don't know the end of this text, I could probably forecast it from your, from your What's gonna anger. What's going to happen? I am imagining that not all of the death and carnage happens that should. Okay. Be, because I know your reading tastes. But... I think that is less to blame on the author and more to blame on the genre. I think that if... It takes a turn, and it's not good. Okay. We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, but that's what I, I find off-putting about this, because I can't argue with you that there's quality here. Uh, I can't argue that I enjoy this, because I, I do clearly enjoy this. And I, I, I'm glad you do. It surprised the hell out of me, to be honest, because yeah. I really thought you would not. We had planned to do this as a four-part series. Part one, part two, part three of the novel, and then the review. I got the fever text at two in the morning. It's like, nope, we're doing it all. Doing it all? Yeah, we're doing it all. We're spreading it out. Yeah. Breaking it down more. We're going to have to, because I've got so many notes for this, and we're already, we're already in, well into this video, and I'm not even halfway through my talking points. Intermission time. Okay. Let's take an intermission. Okay. Take a breather. Is there anything else you'd like to point out? I'm sure I could find something. Um, I think this demonstrates also uh, something. Uh, it, 
not incredibly subtle. That's kind of the point that we're getting for here. But when you break it down, um, we're talking about different economies. District 1 all the way down to District 12. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse my stutter. District 1. Yeah, we're um, going gonna to get into some Freud here. We're going to get into some Freud. But no, we do have a, a different economic class. And I think it, it is very well shown here as Katniss is on the train for the first time experiencing you know, the foods. Um, and, you know, she's eating proper because that's the way she was raised, she was taught. And it wasn't until they point out, oh, you're so much more proper than, the, you know, the normal heathen children we get from this district. That's when she switched, like, all right, whatever. I'll eat how I want, I'll eat with my fingers. We get this difference between this lavish lifestyle in District 1 and this barely scraping by surviving in District 12. And it's a huge point of the novel, but we never really talk about how these are different classes, classes of people. It never is mentioned, but it is. Well, I think that's the subtext of this novel. It, it's well done. Um, and we get it We get it on a clear display in on page 10 with this paragraph. The conversation feels all wrong. Leave? How could I leave Prim, who is the only person in the world I'm certain I love? And Gail is devoted to his family. We can't leave, so why bother even talking about it? And even if we did, even if we did, where did this stuff about having kids come from? There's never been anything romantic between Gail and me. When we met, I was a skinny 12-year-old, and although he was only two years older, he already looked like a man. It took a long time for us to even become friends, to stop haggling over every trade and begin helping each other out. This is genuine aggravation, and it's the aggravation of being trapped in a life you don't want. But not just that. It's the aggravation of being trapped in a life you don't want while knowing there are other lives to be had. Mm -hmm. These people know yes. that their life is garbage. These people also know that other districts exist. Because they're forced to know. Because every single year, not only are we going to take your children and slaughter two of them, because let's be honest, you guys don't stand a chance against what we have. But we're going to make you watch it. And when we look at District 1, District 1 celebrates the Hunger Games as a great, rich tradition. The kids fight to volunteer to be in the Hunger Games. Whereas opposite spectrum, District 12... It's a very remorse time. Like the old idea of war. The proper men go off to war and earn their stripes. The poor boys down the road are going because they have to. It's well done. It is. Um, it's going to be a gruesome text, too. I mean, let's be honest. We are pitting 24 kids in a uh, tournament to kill each other. Yeah. I, we are going to have a lot of gruesome deaths, and there's a lot of good stuff going on here. Um, it, it, it's just what you want to take from this novel, really. I, there's a lot of worth. Do you have some worth you want to sling? Um, well, you, we mentioned war, which brings up the question of District 13. Makes me think that that district was nuked. Okay. Because it was obliterated, quote-unquote. And that's the only thing. The threat of being nuked, I think, is special in the American... In, world, in human psyche, because it is so sudden and so absolute. Okay. And the threat of being nuked might be the only thing that could convince all of these people to live in this way. The threat of being nuked might be the only thing that could get parents to agree to have their kids sign up for a draft in this fashion. Now here's what I find interesting. I don't know if you caught on to this. Where's District 12? What do you mean? In the United States, because this is the United States. Where's District 12? I don't know if it's the East Coast or the Midwest. What? Appalachia. Yeah, okay, the Appalachia. East Coast. That's right, that's right. So, not the coast, the mountains. Right. Where's District 13? I don't know. Moving this way. Because to get to District 1, we have to go okay. all the way over to Day's the... Ride. To the west coast, because that's where the rich are, over in the west coast. Okay. Where's the other rich portion of the American culture? Didn't catch it. It's the east coast. Oh, okay. It's gone. District 13 was something special, obviously. Because if we look at American culture, east coast, west coast, it's always east coast, west coast. You get more poor the further you go in. Right where we are, absolutely broke. So what we're looking at here is this very, very poor stretch of land as District 12. Moving forward, getting progressively better until we reach the rich district over on the West Coast. But if we look at typical American culture, this little strip of land over here where District 13 was, 
that would have also been a wealthy culture. It would have been a culture who would have been vying for power against the other rich culture. So we essentially have the flip of the first civil war. Not north versus south, but east versus west. Not mentioned at all until you break down the geography and you break down how it works in American culture. So it's well done. It is very well done. If you want to talk about things that are flying under the radar until you break them down, what are the ages of people who go into the Hunger Games? Is it 13 where you first have to put your name in once? 12 or 13. 12, I can't 15. remember exactly. I don't either. It doesn't matter exactly. What's the final age? 17, 16? 17 or 18, I think. Right? Okay. Doesn't your really matter. Is that how you would define them? Well, literally 13 yeah, defines right. teenage, so. But is that how you would define Not them? Not necessarily. How would you define them? Adolescence? Puberty. Young adult? Okay. Puberty. Um, roughly the ages where we experience the extent of puberty. Um, and once you're selected for the Hunger Games, things get very serious very quickly. Once you're selected for sexual activity, things get very serious very quickly. And do you remember the most sexual time of your middle school years? Maybe school dances? Okay. What, you know, boys taking girls out. That's fair. What else do you do? That's you, fair. You want to make sure you dress up and look nice. What are they doing at these ceremonies? Gotta dress up and look nice. You sure do, don't you? You sure do. Okay. So defining moments of adolescence. Uh, I think, not adolescence, I think pu I think this is a metaphor for puberty. That's I think nice. this is a metaphor for sexual selection. Okay. Um, even when you get down to the very, very essence of it, survival of the fittest. That's how genes are passed on. Okay. That's right? a good point. It is. Where else you want to go with this? Um, I'm just letting you ramble at this point. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that the rest of my points are related, so the, I'm just going to be making a series of points. There is the three-finger salute for the, for the district, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know what this means? What does this mean? This is the Holy Trinity. Okay. Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. Yeah. So this is very close, isn't it? It is. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. What are we doing here? In the book, we're sacrificing. Yeah. Um, we have to imagine at this point Katniss wins. Okay. What was that? Uh, <laughs> watch the movie. Um, um, so if we're imagining Katniss wins, we're sending her to hell. She becomes the Christ-like figure. Sending her to hell, what is her uh, outfit at the ceremony? Fire. Okay. So she is being set up to be a uh, Christ-like individual. Okay. So we are uh, putting money on this point that Katniss will be the victor. I, I think so. I, 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 hard to have a, a first-person narrated novel and she doesn't survive. Well, there's more books. Um, on page 51, we hadn't had meat in months. The sight of the rabbit seemed to stir something in my mother. She roused herself, skinned the carcass, and made the stew with meat and some more greens Prim had gathered. Then she acted confused and went back to bed. But when the stew was done, we made her eat a bowl. Mother hadn't had meat since father died. Freud. Um, one thing that I think would make this a little... What? Can I pause you for a second? Go ahead. You had such a build up for that and you just wanted to tell a Freud joke. Yep. Okay, just moving on. That's how humor works. Um, I hate you so much. I was expecting a good point. Like I had my serious academic phase on. I'm like, well, yes, mother hadn't had. Oh, no. That's a Freud joke. Well done. Well done, sir. Okay, so coming to us from 65. What it must be like, I wonder, to live in a world where food appears at the press of a button. How would I spend the hours I now commit to, com to combing the woods for sustenance if it were so easy to come by? What do they do these days, these people in the capital, besides decorating their bodies and waiting around for a new shipment of tributes to roll in and die just for their entertainment? California. Well, let's be honest here. That is a good point, though. Um, Adrian, how many hours a week do you work? All of them. You work all of them so you can survive. 
Yeah. If you didn't have to work those hours, wouldn't you be enjoying some luxuries? Reading, writing, doing things that you care for? Reading and writing are serious work. It would not be luxury. Okay, never mind. Moving on. One thing I think that would make this text more interesting, uh, I feel like Katniss knows too much of the inner workings of the Hunger Games. Okay. Well, we get on this train, and this is what we do here, and then we do this, and then we go to the ceremony, and we each have our own designer. You know, it would be interesting if she were being thrust into this. If she were being, if she were not explaining this to the reader, but other characters were explaining this to our protagonist. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay. Does that make any sense? It, it does. Um, I think given the situation, though, because uh, at this point, uh, Katniss, I, again, ages 15, 16, ish. Something like 17, that. 17, I don't know. Um, this is her life. She knows what's going on ever since birth. She's this is witnesses. not her life. She's never been to the games. She's never been to the games, but every single year, like clockwork, she's had to watch. She's had to watch the journey. She's had to watch the parade. She knows how it works. It's part of her culture. So I, I, I can give it there. That's fine. Yeah, I'm not saying it makes it bad. It would def I, But I do think it would definitely make it more interesting if that were the case. Um, on 66, for the opening ceremonies, you're supposed to wear something that suggests your district's principal industry. District 11, agriculture. District 4, fishing. District 3, factories. This means, coming from District 12, PETA and I will be in some type of coal miners get up. Zoolander. I've never seen Zoolander. You've never seen Zoolander? So I have no idea what you're talking about. The hell out of my face. So the idea you were talking about this all being a huge metaphor for puberty, sexuality, things like that. When she is entering the games, when she is moving into adulthood, things are real, what is the first scene we get? Her on display. On display, completely naked. Oh, th okay, that scene. Okay, Having the hair ripped from her legs, naked for the world to see, vulnerable is mentioned multiple times. Yeah, I can give you that. 100%. And not only that, why is her hair being removed? So she is considered more attractive to the District 1 standards. And for other people. How is this being conveyed to her? That they're going to make her beautiful? Um... It's conveyed to her by strange meta-level individuals that don't really mean anything. Correct. So they're like ghosts in the back of your mind. Throw away people. You've got to get rid of the pubic hair because uh, attractive people don't have pubic hair, right? Okay. Never, pubic hair is never given to us, by the way. Did you, did you notice that? It's no. the legs, I think, yeah, that, they, the that they talk about. Well, it's a young adult. Novel, but all so. hair is being removed, you yeah. know, so... It's implied. Uh, so, it, so it's in there. Um... It crosses my, oh, 67. It crosses my mind that Sinna's calm and normal demeanor masks a complete madman. This is how functional madness works, right? It comes out as creativity. Okay. It comes out in a calm demeanor. These are the people that we have to watch out for. Um, but stupid people don't understand that. Um, and that's why Johnny Depp is so over the top. I think you're gonna enjoy this book, Adrian. I'm like I'm really disappointed to say that, but I think you're really going to enjoy this book. You're touching on a lot of good stuff. Carry um, on with your ramblings. Sixty-nine. District two gets in position to follow them. In no time at all, we are approaching the door, and I can see that. And I can see that between the overcast sky and evening hour, the light is turning gray. The tributes from District 11 are just rolling out when Cinna appears to be appears with a lighted torch. Here we go then, he says, and before we can react, he sets our capes on fire. I gasp, wait for the heat, but there's only a faint tickling sensation. Cinna climbs up before us and ignites our headdresses. Then he lets out a sigh of relief. It works. Then he gently tucks a hand under my chin. Remember, heads high, he smiles. They're going to love you. It works. That's subtle. Mm -hmm. That's subtle. Yeah, set him on fire just hoping he didn't yeah, burn him. Yeah, that is, that is something that you're going to have to get most times on a second read-through. Um, on 70, I've got a couple more textual things to point out, and then I've got a talking point. Uh, yeah, I'm just letting you go at this point, just having your heyday. 
I didn't expect this was going to be an hour video. For the time, for the first time, I feel a flicker of hope rising up in me. Surely there is one sponsor willing to take me on. Now, first off, you've got an exclamation point in there, and you never put exclamation point in your in your writing. Um, surely there will be some sponsor willing to take me on, and with a little extra help, some food, the right weapon. Why should I count myself out of the games? I think that is an important point to move forward, looking at the difference between hope and confidence. Okay. Peter hopes he can win, right? That's why he's not upset. Um, Katniss is getting confidence that she can win. There's also a difference between hope and having a chip on your shoulder. Okay. Now, having hope means, boy, I hope I can win these things and survive. Someone who goes into this with a chip on their shoulder, which we sort of feel from Katniss, goes into something like this saying, I might lose, but a couple of them are coming with me. Like that's that, right. Or the, that's like the street fight mentality of, you know what? I'm swinging for the fences, and I might not connect, but somebody's remembering me. No, that's the standard mentality you're supposed to have when you get jumped, and there's more of them. You let them know plain as day, you know you're going to the hospital, but one of you will come with me. Yeah. Anyway, uh, you brought up another good point here. Uh, we're talking about economic status again. Uh, we are getting this, again, just kind of implanted into our brains here. Uh, the idea that the rich, what do the rich do as a pastime? War. Well, it's war. And not only that, but they pick their favorites. They pick the underdogs, the ones that just really sold it, and they just throw a little trinket <laughs> to them. <laughs> oh, you're they just feed them. Boxing. Here's a little food for you. Here's a bow and some arrows. Do things for me. Dance, contestant. Um, on 72, so I think, uh, I think this is a quote from Margaret Atwood, and I wrote Margaret Atwood down with a, a question mark, and I didn't remember to look into this. So okay. there is a quote, he is luring you in to make you easy prey. The more likable he is, the more deadly he is. Uh, men are afraid women will laugh at them, women are afraid men will kill them. Uh, that is a quote that just sort of neatly fits into that. She's very sure that he has alternative um, okay. ideas in mind. So that is the last textual thing that I have to point to. Um, but a conversation piece. It is insane to think that this novel was published in 2008, I believe, right? Uh, it's very recent. It was a recent novel. It was made into a movie almost immediately, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it went over. But... Mine says copyright 2008. Yes. This was published in 2008, 11 years ago. Probably not even that. I'm assuming this was a summer release. I think that's sort of how the, the publishing industry worked with the YA stuff. I'm assuming this was a summer release. Um... And in 2008, the future was still television. Okay. These people are watching this on television. They are. They're not watching this on holograms. Nobody's live streaming this. They're well, not they're, live streaming they're this. They're live streaming, but it's televised. It's no, different. this is reality TV. Okay. Reality TV was a hot ticket item. This is, that is insane to me to sit down and think about. Okay. Now, when I think of 2008... I remember me as I am today. Mm -hmm. I was a very different person back then, though. I was graduating high school, so. What phone did you have? I couldn't tell you. But you had a cell phone, didn't you? I could tell you. It was not a smartphone. No, it wasn't. My smartphone, I got probably a couple years later. It was one of the first ones. It still had a trackball. Blackberry? It wasn't a Blackberry. It was like a T-Mobile Touch or something. It had a trackball. Yeah, of course it did. But no, at 2008, this would have been like right around the time like the Motorola, Motorola Razor or something. Yeah. 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 How much technology was in a Motorola Razor? <laughs> it was a potato. You could barely use the internet on it, right? Correct. That's, that's a good point. So this was before we had the internet roaming in our pockets. It's just strange to me. It is absolutely insane to read this and realize that if the, if the book were written... 36 months later. It would have been a different novel. Television would not be the medium. It would have been internet. Okay. 36 months. That monumental and massive a shift in technology occurred. Well, how do you think Suzanne Collins feels about this? Yeah. So, so that's 36 the thing. months later, she's sitting there like, well, now it's dated. Yeah. Thanks. It's, it, is it or is it not insane? When you thought of Hunger Games, 
when you suggested, when you first suggested we read Hunger Games on the channel, it was 2015. Okay. It was early stages that you said, we've got to do Hunger Games. Okay. This book was seven years old at the time and already extremely dated. We live in that world. We do. How many of your favorite movies, how many of your movies, how many of your favorite movies do you watch periodically? There's a, a handful, maybe. A handful. Name a few of them. Uh, if it's on television, Shawshank Redemption. I'll watch it every single time. Any cell phones in Shawshank Redemption? Not a one. In fact, one of the big things about Shawshank Redemption is Brooks, isn't it? It's Brooks. Brooks was born in 19 odd. And he doesn't understand cars, cars, right? The cars were the big thing Good for point. him. I saw a car once when I was a boy, but now they're everywhere. Right. Give me another movie. Uh, Midnight in Paris. No cell phones. In There's no cell phones in that, is there? What year was that movie? Uh, I was working at Hastings when it came out, so it had to have been uh, in between 2008 and 2012. Okay, so, but but technically, I mean, they're going back in time there. That's fair, fair statement. Uh, it's an artsy movie, so you leave a lot of those daily elements out. What's another one of your favorite movies? Rounders. No cell phones in that, is there? Not it's 98? It's 90s. It's a 90s movie. Yeah. Completely different world as well, though. Completely. Completely different world, because at that point in that movie, he has VHS copies of the World Series of Poker. Wow. So, just as we are talking about the difference between internet and television, DVD and VHS, if that movie had been made six months later... Yeah. Well, it's just like uh, during... a. Uh, any kind of technological boom. I mean, at one point in time, we were literally riding horses to and from, and then all of a sudden, we were taking a train across yeah. the entire so one United of the, States. Um, Industrial revolution. Yeah. One of the, so, along with this, one of the famous quotes from Henry Ford is, people were talking to, how did you invent, you know, how did you do this? How did you revolutionize the United States? And he said, you know, if I'd asked them what they wanted, they'd have said faster horses. Mm -hmm. Right? If you had asked Suzanne Collins how people will watch the Hunger Games, it would be on television, but bigger, right? Big old television yeah. in the middle of the town. In, instead of... Times Square. Where did I put my phone? It'll be on television, but bigger. Instead of on the internet, but smaller. It's true. You know? True. So it's just one of the... It, it, just an ex That is mind-blowing, isn't it? It is. 2008. You don't remember the world is completely different a decade ago? What, year were, you, what year were you born? 1990. 1990. So in 1995, you were five years old. You were in kindergarten. Do you remember kindergarten? Vaguely. Ish, right? Yeah. What was your idea of 1984? Not the book. Oh, 1984? Yeah. Years and years ago, like primitive people. Lifetimes ago. Lifetimes ago. Right? Is, as we are older, isn't that strange to think back on? It is. When I was five in 1990, thinking about 1980s music, my father listened to music from like 1980, 1981. I hated it. Where is this stuff from, right? Okay. It's just insane to think those monumental shifts that happen when you're in the middle of them. I remember I had a friend, and like we're way off topic now, but we're still vaguely on topic. Uh, I had a friend when I was very, very young. No. I did. Lived down the street from me. Had a DOS-style computer. You know, the black screen with the green letters. You had to type everything in. Mind-blowing how amazing it was. Life-changing. He could play these games, and they made games so you could have fun with it. But apparently it did other things because his parents wanted it as well, and they would use it at night. I... Unless you go to like a really old library, you don't even see DOS anymore. It's completely outdated and irrelevant. No. This is my childhood. I'm 20. How old am I? I'm 28 years old. I remember floppy disks being a revolutionary technology. I remember when we had to go to typing class in school because you had to learn how to type using a computer. Back in my day. So I had typing class my freshman year in high school. I had, my freshman year in high school, I had only been exposed to a computer for two years. Yeah. We got a computer when I was in the seventh grade. Um, so I didn't know the, the keyboard. And the final was, 
they pass out this paper with a blank keyboard on it, and you've got to fill it out. Mm -hmm. So, me being me, I wore a white shirt that day, and on the, the little hem of my shirt, my t-shirt, that mm -hmm. bottom hem, I wrote out letter by letter the, the keyboard. So oh, that Adrian. I flipped it up, and I copied it onto my paper. Oh, Adrian, I hate you so much. All right, we are way off topic with send the Hunger Games. Let's send out here. We will be back next week with part two of the Hunger Games. Uh, we will be finishing out part one of the book, correct? Yes. Finishing out part one of the book, uh, and it maybe ends up being another hour-long video. I don't know where we're going at this point. I didn't expect this. But if you would like to join us on this journey through the Hunger Games, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below. Give this video a like as well, because this was an hour of Adrian gushing about a young adult novel. And if you made it this far, I'd like to imagine that amused you. And if you'd like to help us create more great content like this here on Strip Cover Lit, there's a link, as always, to our Patreon to be found in the description below. Yeah, six through nine next week. Six through nine. Six through nine.